Hi, my name is Jill Gamble and I'm the Coastal Resilience Specialist at the University of Georgia uh, Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. UGA is one of the founding partners of the Georgia Climate Project and we're so happy to be um, here with you all. Um, so I help communities in coastal Georgia plan for flooding from sea level rise. However, I live four hours from the coast in Athens, Georgia. As a resident of Athens, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Like so many of the climate leaders that you have met at this conference, Mayor Kelly Gertz is making an impact across multiple domains. As an educator, he served as regional director for student services at Foothills Education Charter High School, a public evening high school supporting nearly 2,000 students at 14 locations across Northeast Georgia, including at three state prisons. Prior to this, he was a teacher and then principal at Classic City High School. Mayor Gertz first ran for office while he was teaching. And after serving as a county commissioner for the last 12 years, he was elected mayor of athens Clark County in January 2018, or I'm sorry, in 2018, taking office in January 2019. He has made sustainability a top priority. Under his leadership, athens Clark County has adopted a 100% clean energy plan, joining Atlanta, Augusta, and Clarkston, Georgia, and transitioning to entirely clean and renewable energy sources. This plan is already being put into action. As earlier this year, athens Clark County dedicated a new solar array, which is expected to produce a million kilowatt hours per year. Just this week, athens Clark County voters approved a package of $15.8 million to fund the equipment and technology needed to support this transition to renewable energy. Yes. <laughs> we are so grateful to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Kelly Gertz. Good morning. I uh, feel a lot like Tim, like we should have gone home about 20 minutes ago. Uh, I'm a music guy, and so it, it's almost like the fake opening act followed the headliner. Like, like Nina Simone came up and sang, I put a spell on you, and then a couple of elected officials are the Milli Vanilli <laughs> with, with, with some fake braids and some lousy dance moves and some lip syncing. So, but we are gonna persist as we do. Uh, so, um, I, I wanna begin by going way back. Um, uh, I'm the son of a lifetime uh, enlisted uh, Naval member, uh, Daryl Gertz, and uh, when my dad was in his second duty station in Oakland, California, uh, in the early 1970s, um, I, I, I had my first memories of life. And, uh, and I think one of my very, very first memories of being in this skin, on this planet, was holding my mom's hand as a probably two or three year old, uh, walking down the street in Oakland, California. And every day, we'd walk by this set of row homes, and at the very end of this row home was a, a fence surrounding a small yard, high fence to a two-year-old. And just over the top of that fence, I could see the bow and the mast of a boat. And so in my two-year-old mind, I thought, behind that house must be the ocean back there, because I could see a boat, and it must be on the water, right? Well, as you know, that was an illusion. Um, and you know, 45 years later, it would be easy to continue to live with illusions. You know, it, it's easy every day to wake up, and I can wake up and think, man, Got some locally roasted coffee on my shelf. Uh, was able to get some uh, organic Target brand half and half that's sitting in my fridge. And uh, gee, the lights come on when I flip the switch. Everything must be dandy, 
just must be. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, the reality of my life now as an elected policymaker is that I can't live with the same kind of illusions that I could live with when I was two years old, walking down that street in Oakland. Um, because if I held illusions, I'd be ignoring lots of facts and lots of realities. I'd be ignoring the fact that our topsoil in Athens, where I live and across the state, has been decimated over two centuries. Uh, I'd be ignoring the loss of tree canopy and old growth forests in our state. Uh, I'd be ignoring the sedimentation of our rivers and streams and the commensurate loss of hundreds of species. And, and I'm not in the uh, maybe enviable position to be able to live with illusions and ignore all these things. Uh, I can't ignore the heat island effect that we have even in a relatively small metropolitan area uh, of Athens, Georgia with the 130,000 residents in my jurisdiction and the 250,000 residents in our small metro. Um, now, th that means that not living with illusions, I've got to think in solid terms. I've got to think in tangible terms. And for politicians, that can be difficult because politicians sometimes like to think in grandiose terms. They like to think in terms of fairy dust and magical thinking. And you probably have recognized for private institutions and public institutions alike, when we are at our rock bottom shittiest is when we are using magical thinking in the midst of big transformations and big transitions. You know, you can look at the Sears Roebuck Company as an example of a company who is failing through an enormous transition in retail. You can think about the dwindling local paper in your community if you even still have one as a set of institutions struggling through big transitions. You can think about the music industry where, you know, Folks may be able to make a record in their bedroom, but they're not going to make any money on that like they could make a generation ago. And certainly, you can think of our climate, and you can think of folks like Joe Manchin in West Virginia who struggle to figure out how to manage amidst transitions because we're not so good at that. You look at what could have been true 30 or 40 years ago when everybody saw the future coming. Yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful for the work of Tim and his colleagues getting us off of coal in this state where there's been a dramatic reduction in its use. I certainly want to continue to see that reduction just like I also want to see the reduction in every other fossil fuel, including gas. But these transitions are gonna mean we have to think in real, solid, tangible terms. Um, I think Jill is kind enough to reference some of the work that we've done in Athens, and uh, we have been making tangible transitions for some time now. Um, one of the things that sucks the most energy from any local government, municipality, or county is your water supply system. Treatment of fresh water, and management of your wastewater. So we installed just a year ago a solar facility at uh, about 600 kilowatts that's gonna take half the load off one of our three waste treatment facilities. So that's a tangible thing that we can do and, and I'm proud of that work. We have to put plans in place to extend that work though. And uh, it's not gonna fall from the sky like manna from heaven. Uh, it's not gonna land on my front porch like a meteor out, out of the space. It's gonna take real planning. Um, I, I'll just admit to you, I'm standing up here, I'm kind of the imposter in local government. And um, we have a, a great gentleman, Andrew Saunders, who is our sustainability officer in athens Clark County, uh, who is the real deal. 
and uh, I've worked with Andrew, and this fiscal year we're spending $70,000 to have his office and some other consultants who are also the real deal put together those tangible steps that are make, gonna make sure that we lead to completely coal-free energy in the 2030s and a completely fossil fuel-free transportation system by 2050. Thank you. And I can stand up here and I can honestly say, I wish those were earlier years. I wish we were there already. We need to be there already. But I also have to acknowledge that we're not living in the land of Oz and that there's not a golden path to follow. That we've got to think in practical, actual terms. I don't have a supply of fairy dust in my office. It's just not there. It's not doing anything. So I'm very excited that 78% of those folks who turned out to vote just three days ago on Tuesday approved the tangible dollars, the nearly $17 million that we are gonna be able to spend over the next decade transitioning to completely coal-free energy in athens Clark County. You know, when you're in, um, when you're in the political world, you know, you, you hedge your bets sometimes and you, you know, you have this kind of over under thinking like, well, you know, how far can we go? How fast can we go? Uh, w what's exciting, I think parallel with what the PSC has seen is that we started with a $10 million conversation over a decade and we ended up with nearly $17 million over a decade. And I had hoped that best case scenario, 65% of the voters would find favor with this, but in fact it was 78% of the voters. And so that means this is on people's actual minds. You know, th this is something that's going to make a difference for everybody within our jurisdiction. And I'm excited about that. We've done a lot of other things in athens Clark County. I think one of the things we always have to think is how do we reduce the bad stuff we're doing and enhance the great stuff we're doing. You know, we've got to make that fulcrum work on both ends. So again, we're reducing coal, but we're enhancing our tree canopy dramatically. So we have 20% of our land mass that's permanently protected tree canopy. And in fact, with that voluntary tree canopy beyond that, we have over 40% of our land mass that's tree canopy right now. And we're gonna to continue to go north from there. We also have to deal with the very tangible reality that we have a lot more people living in our jurisdiction. In 1962, there were 45,000 people in the combination of the then Athens and the then Clark County. Now as a unified government under that same landmass, we have 130,000 people. So if we've tripled population, we've got to think very differently about where and how people live. So we are going to be dramatically increasing some density opportunities within athens Clark County to make sure people are clustered close to the amenities and the resources they need, close to schools, close to grocery stores, close to parks, and that this is going to enhance the efficacy of everything in our community, enhance our economy, enhance our public transportation system. But that doesn't come without challenges. Uh, you know, every, every community around the state has its NIMBYites and uh, ha has folks who might say that they want a cleaner environment. And, and in fact, you know, just fun fact you probably know, uh, you know, if you find the lowest carbon footprint per individual, that would be in Manhattan within these United States. And that's because you've got a lot of people clustered in close proximity. And every community in this state needs to realize that, you know, especially relatively low density but high population metros like the one that we're in right now. And speaking of the metro we're in right now, uh, I, I'm looking up at the screen and I'm reading that this is the Georgia Climate Conference, uh, that, it's, that it's not just the Atlanta and a couple of other places climate conference. <laughs> And while I'm deeply committed and devoted to my life as a policymaker, as mayor of the unified government of athens Clark County, 
I realize that the conversation cannot and must not stop at our borders or the borders of the city of Atlanta or the borders of DeKalb County or the borders of Savannah or Chatham County. We have to say to ourselves, what's in this for Ludowisi? What's in this for Fitzgerald? What's in this for Blue Ridge? What's in this for Swainsboro? For more than a generation, folks in this state have been talking about the two Georges. And we can't think that one of those two Georges is still lagging so far behind that you can't even see him over the horizon. Uh, in, in the last job that I was in before uh, I was in the mayor's seat, uh, I traveled all over the state supporting public educators, um, particularly those who were setting up evening high school programs in non-traditional settings. So I'd find myself at these conference centers all over the place. If you travel down Highway 441, uh, if you pass Dublin coming from my, my part of the state, uh, you, you find yourself near the Little Loch Mulgee State Park. And if you find yourself on that stretch of Highway 441, you, you, you can read these sort of moldy signs on the side of the road that call that Georgia's high-tech corridor. Uh, it, it's, it, it's intriguing when you do that because sometimes the highest tech thing you'll see on that stretch of 441 is a rusted out combine on the side of the road. And, and you'll wonder whatever happened to that notion of Georgia's high-tech corridor, you know, and that, that sign appears to be somewhere from the Zell Miller administration age. Uh, but we really do need to be thinking about every one of those communities in small town and in rural Georgia. There, there's been an enormous amount of press and an enormous amount of writing and a certain amount of hand-wringing from politicians about what do we do to keep the brain drain from happening in those communities, to keep those communities economically vital. And while there are, again, practical, tangible things that we have to think about, like where our um, high carrying power lines are, we should very much be thinking about the link between places like Atlanta and places like Athens and places like Savannah to places like Oscilla because if we are not healthy throughout the state, that's gonna be an anchor around everybody's neck in the state. So I, I really appreciate everybody being here. I, I appreciate so much the programming schedule here today with the headliner right plunked in the middle and uh, two elected officials to follow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I, I appreciate every one of the educational institutions who's part of this. Um, particularly glad that the Ray Anderson Foundation was a, a sponsor of this event. If you're not familiar with Ray Anderson, he was a true giant in this state. Uh, a, a gentleman who in his life, um, prior to his sad early death, uh, demonstrated that you can actually earn a buck and do transformational things in the economy. Um, if you've not had the opportunity to view it, uh, you can go online and you can watch Ray talk about um, that illusion that I talked about earlier. And Ray would say that we carry with us this illusion that we're flying through the sky like Superman, like an eagle but really we're just in free fall and our asses are gonna hit the earth pretty soon. <laughs> I, I, I wanna close sort of echoing a theme that, that we heard earlier from, from the rock star, the presentation, um, and, and that is this notion that we're not doing this just for ourselves, but we're doing this for the next generation and the one to follow and the one after that. And in the same way that as a public policy maker who's standing in front of you in 2019, I wish that people had made different decisions 40 and 100 and 150 years ago. We now have the opportunity to make sure that there aren't those future regrets. Uh, as the parent of a seven-year-old son who's back home in Athens in his first grade class right now, uh, I reflect on this uh, in a significant way every day. So I'm just gonna end with a short statement that was part of the resolution 
that passed the athens clark county commission 10 to 0 earlier this year setting up this 17 million dollar expenditure on clean energy that i referenced and the commission approved the statement whereas youth and future generations will be impacted more significantly by climate disruption than those currently in positions of power we must recognize that youth will inherit the effects of the decisions of the past and have the most to lose from a lack of action in the present and will spend their lives leading the transition to a truly green and sustainable economy. So God bless you and thank you for having me.